So this is how freelancers can create value and earn a good living. Um, and I like to start my classes and my presentations with this phrase, it's another day of opportunity. And the reason I like to do that is because uh, I want to be forward looking. Um, when you're faced with lots of problems, uh, it, you, we can be very pessimistic about that. But when, we're, when we think about what we could do to change things when we're looking forward uh, and we begin to take some steps, uh, it gives us confidence, it makes us feel like what we're doing is worthwhile uh, and it, it, it's positive. And so we're gonna change, we're gonna change the world. Okay, <laughs> and I'm going to show you some some things uh, about how to do that. Now, because I'm an American, you know, we're very we tend to be rather innocent and optimistic. That's one of our weaknesses, but that's also a strength. Uh, so let's look forward. Okay, so the world now, you know, it's 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 pretty bad. Um, we're going to look at that. We're going to discuss your strengths. We're gonna talk about your opportunities, uh, how to create value for customers and how to run a business. We're gonna do that, all of that in about 30 minutes. So obviously we're just going way across the top of the surface of things, but um, I'm gonna give you some tools uh, on my website, which is jamesbrenner.com down here. Um, uh, you don't look at it now, I'll put this stuff up later, okay. So um, in a global context, the way things are now, it's the end of advertising. The game is over. Advertising is dead. Uh, di digital advertising is dead. Um, the, the people who are the, the publications, many of them publications that you work for, um, they're chasing clicks, which results in, they go for sensationalism, that, which results in low quality. And none of you want to do that. You don't want to do low quality work. And this is frustrating for you, I'm sure. The, uh, the duopoly of Facebook, Google, and then uh, the other tech platforms, they're taking all the advertising. And that results in falling advertising rates, which results in publishers who have less money to pay, and then so they're cheap. They 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 mistreat you. Uh, you get slow pay, and so all those things are are bad. Uh, so that's the bad part. So if you don't like the media, make your own. Some of you who have already done that, and I'm going to walk you through uh, some some ways to think about this in a disciplined way to to make your own media. Many times um, when journalists try to become entrepreneurs or when, they're, when they have something up and going, uh, the first thing that, that they wanna talk about with me, and I, I've worked with lots of digital media entrepreneurs, the first thing they wanna talk about is how do I raise money? How do I generate funds? How do I, and really that's the wrong place to start because you can't really uh, develop that without uh, answering a few other questions. Um, as you try to, if you've, you've already made your um, website or product, um, you, you don't really need to talk about this, but uh, design thinking is one way to think about uh, what kind of a product that you could create. So you think, well, what could I do? Well. Uh, do some reading about design thinking. That gives you a sort of an intellectual framework for this. Another way to think about this is what do you wish existed in the media but doesn't exist now? Um, something, something that you wish was available but none of the other media organizations uh, out there are providing. Uh, what are the big media missing? Very frequently, they provide just sort of superficial coverage of things that really matter to people, such as uh, what's going on in science and technology, what's going on in public schools, what's going on with healthcare in their country, um, what's going on with the in environmental impact, economic development on the local level, trans public transportation. A lot of times they don't do very good coverage at all. And these can be opportunities for you to create something. Um, ask your friends and your family and your colleagues, you know, if, 
if there could be a new media organization, what, what kind of information do you want that's not available now? Uh, what can you do about that? And another important part of this is uh, don't do it if you don't feel strongly about it. Uh, don't, don't do this if you're just going to try to make money uh, it, because it's too hard as the people who are already doing these entrepreneurial ventures and, and you as freelancers know. Uh, it's very hard to do uh, a, an independent project when you're, when you're not really interested in or passionate about it. So I would do that. So one of the things you need to think about is, you know, what makes you different? Because different is better. Different is better. So think about what it is about you that's that's different. So what are some of the skills that you have that other people don't? Now, maybe a lot of you may be writers. I know I, that's how I started. Uh, I consider myself a writer, but I also consider myself something of a teacher. But I've also along the way picked up other skills with things like uh, spreadsheets and use of spreadsheets and creating infographics and interactive maps and things like that. So what are your skills? Uh, your partners could be a strength for you. When I talk about partners, I'm talking about uh, maybe civil society organizations that you have a relationship with. For example, if you write about the environment or you write about um, uh, uh, human rights or whatever, you may have those organizations may be able to help you uh, spread, you know, when you create something, they may help amplify your voice. They may spread your content for you. Uh, your distribution uh, could be uh, a, an advantage. There's a guy in Venezuela um, who has a, a website called Pro Da Vinci. Uh, and he, because of sent government censorship, he distributes his content through WhatsApp. And so WhatsApp is maybe something different about him that would be valuable. Maybe your technology is different. Maybe you have, if you have a website or you, uh, or a blog or something, maybe you uh, have mastered particular types of software that other people don't really know how to use. And that could be something that would be uh, different about you that would create value for users. Another thing could be your format, your, your design. Uh, artistic design, beautifully designed uh, pages uh, can be uh, an attractive thing in themselves. That's a way to create value. This is not what creating beautiful things is not one of my skills. Um, so I try to focus on, on other things when I create my blogs. Okay, it's all about users. In, you know, we mentioned uh, that advertising that business is dead. Um, all the trend, no, no, it's not completely dead. Um, there are plenty of independent uh, websites and independent digital entrepreneurs who are getting some advertising, but it's often of a different kind. It's called native advertising. In Spanish, we call it publi reportaje, um, but it's, uh, it's presented, it's, it, it's somewhat like, um, the editorial product of a of a news organization, but it's clearly marked as advertising, but it's aligned with the content of the uh, publication. At any rate, now we're talking about users. We need to, if we're going to generate revenue, we're going to generate revenue from users. That's that's the biggest trend that's going on in, me in media all around the world, and business model generation. Um, has a, uh, is all about that, Th that could help you. Business model generation has a tool in it called uh, the business model canvas. And although the business model uh, canvas and this book are not specifically about media, there are lots of uh, elements of a, a discipline of thinking about an, an, an enterprise and building a business that could help you a lot. So one of the things that, one of the questions that comes up in this, in the business model canvas is how can you help solve the problems of 
your customers, your potential customers, you know, what kind of problems they have. Uh, there's a website in um, uh, Colombia called Actualicese, which it's, it's directed at accountants, accountants. And uh, it helps those people, those professionals with the problems that they have in their business as accountants. And this guy has developed a, over many years, uh, he started out just publishing a few things on a blog, but uh, other accountants saw it and thought it was valuable and it helped these people solve the business problems that only accountants have. So uh, it's, it's a very specific niche. You know, for you, maybe you create something like this for accountants or something. I, I don't know, that's a possibility. There's another very successful, and, and by the way, Actualicese has a, a paywall and they generate lots of revenue from their users. Another uh, example of this is helping people solve their problems is a website in Brazil called Jota or Jota, uh, and it's aimed at lawyers. Uh, well, originally it was aimed at lawyers, but now it's aimed at all business people who have problems with the Brazil's very complicated system of taxation. So they have, he's got, he started out with just writing about um, the Supreme Court and then they expanded into uh, the tax system and then they expanded into what the legislature was doing and then they expanded into what regulatory systems were doing. So now he's got, he started out with, I think two or three guys and now they have 63 employees. And so that's, Jota uh, or Jota in Brazil. Uh, there are links to these examples, by the way, on the sheet that we're, we're sharing with you at the end of this. So all these things I'm mentioning, you're going to be able to access. Um, you need to produce information and uh, news that they need. That, that's the example from those two. Uh, in both of those cases, the audience is relatively small. The Actualicese wasn't trying to get the everybody in Colombia and Jota is not trying to get everybody in Brazil, just certain people. And when you focus like that and create value, um, nobody else is creating it. Because no one else is creating it, you have a business opportunity. It's all about your relationship with your users, not great numbers of users. You don't need great, 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 great numbers of users. You don't need scale. Scale is nice. I mean, we're obviously we want whatever you're doing, you're going to want as big an audience as you can get, right? But, but the point is that uh, many uh, media today have lost their way because, uh, as you know, they're all about how many clicks are we getting, how many page views, how many unique users. And th those numbers, those are a big lie because many of those unique users and many of those page views are generated by people who by accident land on the website, click, they see, I'm not interested and they leave. And that's often 80% of the people, 80% of those unique users, 80% of those page views. So. You don't want to, you're not, you don't want to be thinking about scale. You want to be thinking about a relationship built on the fact that you create valuable stuff. So uh, loyalty is important. Going back to those two examples, uh, Jota and uh, Actualicese, um, they, both of them have paywalls and people have to pay to subscribe, but they also have very large audiences uh, of people who are accessing some part of the content which is free and they what they do is they try to identify who are these people who are getting our content for free who are coming back again and again and again and if you identify loyal people those are the people who are most likely to be willing to pay something they're likely to either they might want to pay to attend an event they might want to pay for a subscription. They might want to buy one of your books. They might want to buy something. So 
So you have to, uh, how to know your target users. Um, again, these are the loyal people. These are the people who, it's not the great mass of humanity out there. It's the people who are really interested in a very specific topic or a very or coverage of a very specific geographic area or a coverage that's somehow different uh, and valuable for that reason. Um, I have a very useful link on the document that I'm going to share with you about target users, but I'll go through some of the, uh, the most obvious ones first. Google Analytics will help you. Um, one of the uh, links on the extra sheet that I'm going to be sharing with you tells you how to identify as a whole system for identifying loyal users on Google Analytics. Facebook Analytics can help you, Twitter Analytics, Instagram. And the most important thing, I think, is to listen to your users. Uh, interview them, survey them. In Spain, uh, we have a very successful digital news site called El Diario.es. And El Diario.es, the, the publisher, they, they started out a few years ago with eight people on their staff, all experienced journalists. They now have a hundred. But one of the things that uh, makes them stand out is, for example, the top guy in the organization, Ignacio Escolar, he responds directly to, to people who are, who have complaints. He was, he, he has a whole team of people who collect complaints and suggestions from users and they pick some of them and they send, send them to him, especially the people who are really upset. And he personally answers them. He personally answers them. This is a website with millions of visits every month. And he, he mentioned in a conversation I was listening to just a few days ago that he may be answering in a week. He may have five of these emails one day and three the next and then none. But the interactivity with the audience, the, that willingness to engage and respond to their complaints when they're really angry. That's important. When I was a publisher of a business newspaper, I gave instructions to our receptionist, never, never screen the calls. Just, you know, if a person called and said they wanted to talk to the publisher or they wanted to talk to James Briner or they had a complaint, I told the receptionist, send me the, that call. Um, People are surprised and they're impressed. They're impressed. So you wanna, you wanna create that kind of sense of openness, interactivity. We're not just sending stuff out, but we're listening to you. So you really need to, that, that's such a powerful aspect of digital media that not enough people take advantage of that. So uh, that's a big suggestion I have for all of you. All right, so let's talk about value proposition. Um, again, business model canvas, uh, basically it looks at nine building blocks of a business model. And I'm only talking about the first two today. One of them is know your clients, know what your clients need, know what your clients' problems are and help them solve them. So what's your value proposition is the second thing to look at. You know, now that you have an idea of who your clients are, how, you're, how are you going to create value for them? So let's take a look at that. One, one way is just newness, uniqueness. Um, we're going to create something that's unavailable anywhere else. Excuse me. And um, when I was a publisher of the business journal, the Baltimore Business Journal, uh, and the Columbus Business Journal, um, one of the things that we did that re was very popular with our readers is we did uh, coverage of sports as a business, the business side of sports, all, all the aspects of who's sponsoring which sports team, 
um, the cost of building new stadium facilities, um, contracts for uh, consultants and all sorts of things like that and suppliers. Um, this particular coverage, we, we had 40 business journals all over the US and all of them were doing business coverage of the business of sports. Eventually the company created something called the Sports Business Journal, which is now, um, it's international, it's very successful and profitable. It's because they're covering something nobody else is covering. You got people covering sports and you got co people covering business, but you don't have many people covering the business of sports. Uh, we did the same thing in Baltimore. We did a uh, coverage of culture. So many of you are interested in writing about culture and cultural institutions and cultural organizations, but there could be an opportunity to cover the business side of cultural institutions. In the US, uh, these organizations are often nonprofits and you can, there are requirements for them to publish information and you can get the documents and study them. I know uh, in Great Britain, uh, they have this wonderful service called Companies House. And when I worked there, I worked in Britain uh, for about six months launching the, uh, the Manchester Business Journal, which no longer exists. But um, we used Companies House a lot. Again, you wanna get exclusive information and uh, if you're covering culture, the business of culture, that could be a niche. Um, where the information is available could be of value. I mentioned the guy in Venezuela through WhatsApp. Uh, maybe you're publishing information on TikTok or Spotify or Snapchat, and maybe that's your competitive advantage because you're using a distribution channel that reaches young people and news organizations are all trying to reach young people because young people, they don't read newspapers, they don't read magazines, they don't watch TV, they're not normal TV. So these kinds of things could be ways for you to create something of value to an audience and that would also be of value to others. Maybe you go deeper on a topic than anybody else. Uh, maybe your storytelling is different, you use data or graphics or maps as opposed to narratives. Um, I'm gonna say something that might upset some of you. Okay, are you ready? I don't wanna, I don't wanna offend anybody and I don't wanna to appear to be a person without com compassion. But uh, uh, many times when, for example, there's a natural disaster, all the media organizations rush out and do stories about the sad state of victims of the disaster. And so everybody is doing the same kind of story, the sad story of the victim of the disaster. But what about if uh, a news organization in that kind of situation provided a different kind of coverage, such as a map of all the gasoline stations that are open or a map of all the stores that have ice or a map of where public internet is available despite the disaster, that kind of thing. So think in turn a little bit different, differently. Think in different kinds of ways to serve readers because basically what you're, you're doing there, you're serving readers and giving them information. Uh, another way to distinguish yourself is by publishing in a neglected language or covering a geography that nobody else is covering. Um, I'm familiar with uh, in the uh, Balkan, uh, Balkan states, um, there are very successful small media who are publishing in the local language or they're covering only the particular geography for that group or ethnicity and they provide a valuable service that nobody else is providing. So. And again, partners, your partners could be the value that you have and that you can, um, you can reach bigger audiences with an interest about say environmental issues or public education or public health. Okay. Um, here's some examples of people who created a personal brand. 
Brian Stelter. He was a college student at Towson University in Baltimore. Nobody, none of you have ever heard of it. Um, it's a public university. He's not from a rich family. He just was sitting in his room writing a blog about um, how uh, cable television outlets were covering the Iraq war. And his audience was only the people at those cable news outlets. But these are powerful people and they were reading his blog and none of them knew he was 19 years old. He published it anonymously. But he, because he was publishing so frequently and people in those organizations started giving him tips, pretty soon someone bought the blog and then the New York, and then when he graduated from university, the New York Times hired him as a media columnist. Nobody, the New York Times never hires a kid out of college, never. So he had established his brand. And then I wondered how long is, uh, how long does Brian Stelter need the New York Times? Because he had 300,000, 400,000 Twitter followers. And pretty soon CNN grabbed him. And now he's, he has a program, um, reliable sources on CNN. The Skim, uh, two young women TV producers in New York. Uh, they, they were disturbed that none of their friends were watching any of the uh, news programs that they were producing. They thought, let's create something for our friends uh, who are young women, professionally oriented, educated, who are interested in their career and their social life and personal life, and who want, to, want, to, want treatment of this in a kind of a humorous way. So the, the, two, the two women, Danielle Weisberg and uh, Carly Zakin, they, they launched a, an email newsletter. Now, some of you will say, well, email is dead. No, email has been roaring back lately. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. And they just, on the ground, they were passing out flyers. Please sign up for, give us your email address. We'll send you this interesting stuff. Long story short, in a few years, they built up to 7 million, 7 million email subscribers to the skim, which was news, th news that you need to know for your career, your professional life, and your personal life. Business of Fashion was found, it was a blog post by a consultant um, who he had clients he was a consultant to businesses in the fashion industry, uh, but he was really interested in the connecting the creative part of fashion with the business part of fashion. So he started blogging, merging those two things. Remember what I was telling you about sports and business? Well, he was connecting fashion and business. Uh, his blog became popular, long story short, now it's, uh, he's got 70 employees in three cities, and he charges $250 a year for a subscription. Jorcentual.es, this is a guy, he was a journalist, a business journalist in Salamanca. The, the daily newspaper laid him off. He got, well, in Spain, we call it a finiquito. It's a severance pay. He got, and it's ge fairly generous in Spain. Uh, so he had some money and he had some time. So he created a service uh, which pulls data from publicly available databases. And then he uh, hired a couple programmers to create the waka 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 that takes the data and produces maps and graphics. And now he produce and he can, he can localize them. So he can create um, maps and graphics for a television station in Malaga, which has unemployment figures for Malaga over time, or has um, other information about, say, the local economy, if it's going up or down, and so on. Uh, Pro Da Vinci, I've already talked about. And then Firewire in Chile. Well, actually, it's all over Latin America. But um, his, um, his value proposition was 
we're going to write about new technology like new cell phones and new software and the quality of various um, data services. And their distinguishing uh, characteristic was their ethics. Ethic, they, you know, they made a big deal out of this. We don't accept any, we don't accept any free stuff to try out. We buy it all. And therefore, when we report on it, we tell the truth. So that was their, their, uh, their value. Um, all right. I, I'm going to wrap this up. So where to start? Email newsletter, they're intimate, they're personal. Um, start with your friends and family. They have what's called a high open rate. Um, email newsletters get very often, a good one will get an open rate where people will click on at least one item 30% of the time. That's about 30 times better than uh, a link in a Facebook ad or a Twitter ad. Uh, you can gain subscribers on sub Substack. You can create a group of new newsletters and magazine and some of the obstacles. We get in the way. We, we try to figure out reasons why we don't have time. We don't have money. We can't do it. It's too hard. Or when we launch a, uh, when we launch a website, we got a team, a, a football field, football team of midfielders. We don't, we don't have any strikers and we don't have any goalies. The striker, uh, we have all journalists. Journalists are the midfielders. Uh, you need some strikers to, and those would be people who are doing the marketing and the sales. And you need some people in technology. They're the goalkeepers. They're the ones who keep you in the game. Uh, very often journalists, we don't like the word business. We don't like the word money. We don't like the word profit. We don't like the word marketing. We feel sort of icky about it. And that's why you wanna hire somebody who doesn't feel awkward about it. Okay, some, some of you may say, well, um, I, wanna, I don't wanna share this idea. I have a really great idea and I don't wanna share it. The problem you have is nobody's, nobody's gonna steal your idea. The problem you're gonna have is nobody cares about your idea. So uh, my recommendation is share your idea of a new business with as many people as possible and get them to help you and support you. Um, if you're running a business, keep, a, keep your day job, create a budget, create a minimum viable product. The, I want them to, what you want to be able to do is to create a, a good enough product that's a, it's a, as of ex, acceptable quality and it's unique and it's the best that you can do with the money and the time that you have. That's a minimum viable product. And your budget uh, you could create around that. I'm not going to go into it right now. There's, there's an article on the, on the resource sheet which goes into it. But one thing, cash flow. And in Spanish, uh, flujo de caja. The, you always want to know how much fuel you've got in the tank. That means how much money do we have? If our monthly expenses are 1,000 euros, uh, and we have, we start the year with 12,000 euros in cash, then we can go for, we got enough fuel for one year. So you want to be, you want to, you want to be thinking all the time of cash flow. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Go for it. You don't need any permission. Nobody has, you can just go ahead and do it. Uh, you don't have to ask me for permission. You don't have to ask anybody for permission. This is the great thing about digital media. Just go for it, just do it, okay? So let's go for questions. <laughs>